Christy Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. This is our second week discussing the life of George Bernard Shaw, as well as his most famous piece, Pygmalion. Last week, we introduced this um, Nobel Prize winning author, as well as gave some background as to his life, his personality, and his controversial views. We discussed a Greek myth, Pygmalion, from which Shaw took the title. Uh, we also introduced the characters as we meet them in Act 1. And today, our goal is to get through Acts 2 and 3, which will take us through the climax of the play. And I didn't realize that the climax was in the third act by watching a movie or a play production. That I'd always thought uh, of it as the ball or the garden party, like in the movie uh, My Fair Lady. I also didn't know how dogmatic Shaw was about everyone wanting to change his ending, not just to the play, but even more so for the movie production that actually won him an Oscar for Best Screenplay. And he has particularly choice words to say uh, for it as only he can choose them. And (laughs) he is uh, freakishly articulate. And um, he, like Higgins in Pygmalion, is a lovable, uh, often foul-mouthed bully at times. Well, they're both the same. Charles Poor commented on this in the New York Times on March 23rd in 1949. He said, The greatness of George Bernard Shaw has often been obscured by his own blinding and enthusiastic appreciation of it. (laughs) (laughs) He liked to admire his own work, didn't he? Yes, he he did. Well, that, that sounds exactly like something Shaw would say about himself. I mean, the way Shaw took this obnoxious prophet persona called GBS and made it into a global brand GBS. And, you know, without it, he he might have been just an obscure Irish music critic and a failed novelist and a semi-successful playwright. But with it, he became legendary. Well, that's true. And on May 7, 1908, a famous drama critic gave his predictions for the GBS play Getting Married. This is what the critic said. There will be nothing but talk, 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 Shaw talk. The characters will seem to be simply a row of Shaws, all arguing with one another on totally uninteresting subjects. Shaw in a bishop's apron will argue with Shaw in a general's uniform. Shaw in an alderman's town will argue with Shaw dressed in a beetle. Shaw dressed as a bridegroom will be wedded to Shaw in petticoats. The whole thing will be hideous, indescribably, an eternity of brain-racking dullness. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that sounds harsh. Um, but exactly the sort of comment his critics were making is they insisted that uh, Shaw shouldn't be taken seriously for all of his moralizing and that it was overshadowing his art. Yes, and that, of course, is the accusation. But here's the irony of that particular criticism. Guess who wrote that piece of criticism in the paper? Well, of course, I know. But to answer your question, Shaw himself wrote that. (laughs) He's daring his critics. No, he's mocking his critics, acknowledging that, yes, his plays are didactic. And uh, yes, perhaps he is the he is lecturing us through every character. But that's what's successful. And people like that his plays have something to say. The themes drive the art, you know, and not the other way around. And he would never back down uh, that his plays were really just arguments on stage. When a Shaw play, it's the talking that's interesting. His thoughts are what are interesting. Don't go to a Shaw play to see gimmicks or slapstick comedy, even though all of them except one are comedies, because they contain no violence. There's not even a romantic love interest. Nothing but ideas on stage with almost nothing by way of plot. But since the talking is interesting and funny, we're hooked. I think, uh, you know, interesting, if I, if I think what might be a modern equivalent, could, could you say they're almost like his own version of Jerry Seinfeld's hits from the 90s that he famously claimed was literally the show about nothing or, or maybe even more recently The Office? Yeah, I, I think in some ways that is true. Uh, I don't think Seinfeld or Greg Daniels of The Office claim to be the philosopher that you know Shaw claimed to be, but there is the parallel that you're bringing out that does hold true in Seinfeld's comedies and The Office and in Shaw's plays. The most common emotion that we see on stage is anguish. You don't cry in a Shaw piece and you don't fall in love either. And, of course, Office and Seinfeld kind of work in the same kind of way. 
The comedy in all of these hinges on the detachment of the viewers. The laughter is in the language. It's in the relationship between people, not the events as they unfold or even the circumstances. What's great about both Shaw's plays and Seinfeld sitcoms are the lines. Everything is quotable. Which brings us to where we are in this play. In Act 1, Higgins declares that a woman, such as Eliza, who utters such depressing and disgusting sounds, has no right to be anywhere, no right to live, and that she must remember that she is a human being with a soul and the divine right of articulate speech. He calls her a squashed cabbage leaf, but then brags publicly that under his tutelage, he could pass her off as a duchess, as the Queen of Sheba. <laughs> In Act 2, um, Eliza shows up at his home on Wimpole Street to take him up on his boast, and Pickering and he make a bet that it can be done, and Higgins sets out to create a duchess out of a flower girl, and although we will notice that never stops the constant barrage of insults to her character. And that's important to notice, because it's overwhelming, and it's brutish. He's a bully. In Act 2, we see Shaw, the philosopher, continue to develop several ideas, and we start to see him develop these ideas through a series of symbols. Of course, the most obvious discussion will be on the class system or social hierarchies, but we will speak about feminist ideals and the general hypocrisy of humanity at large. And the first obvious symbol is language itself. Shaw is making an undeniable assertion that language and pronunciation are determinant of social equality and inequality. For Higgins, there is a simple equation between voice, body, and soul. He, of course, sees everyone as a function of this connection, almost exclusively. But interestingly enough, although he claims throughout the play that he treats everyone the same, we can see from the get-go that it is far from true. He can be rude to everyone for sure, but Eliza, he treats her particularly worse than anyone else. And after a while, we have to ask why. He deliberately dismantles Eliza's sense of self. She is a nothing, and he will remind her of that to the end of the play. A flower girl is nothing worthy of anything but the gutter. He asks Pickering right in front of Eliza, shall we ask this object to sit down? He calls her deliciously low, a draggle-tailed gutter snite. As he tells Mrs. Pierce to take her to the bath and clean her up, he puts it even more dehumanizing. And, and let's read that quote. Take all her clothes off and burn them. Ring up Whiteley or somebody for new ones. Wrap her up in brown paper till they come. And to her credit, she reacts to this and she fights back, claiming as low as she admittedly is. She is still a person of worth, a human with feeling. And she uses a particular phrase over and over and over again. She keeps claiming that she's a good girl. Yeah, yeah, that phrase is a placeholder, you know, to, to symbolize how she intuitively understands, uh, even without the proper words, that she is being degraded. Um, she is dehumanized in his eyes, and, she, and she really is a credit to her strength that even in this um, degraded state that she still pleads for her own humanity. Well, everyone else sees it, too. I mean, Mrs. Pierce tries to remind him that she is not a pebble he is picking up off the beach. She warns them that he needs to think about what will become of her if he meddles in her life. Eliza reminds him that she has feelings, but all of this he ignores. His response to all of this is to take a piece of chocolate, split it, eat one half while giving her the other. It ultimately boils down to a contract, and he's going to vocalize this contract. Let's read it. There, that's all you'll get out of Eliza. Ah, uh, no use explaining. As a military man, you ought to know that. Give her her orders. That's enough for her. Eliza, you are to live here for the next six months, learning how to speak beautifully, like a lady in a florist shop. If you're good and do whatever you're told, you shall sleep in a proper bedroom and have lots to eat and money to buy chocolates and take rides in taxis. If you're naughty and idle, you will sleep in the back kitchen among the black beetles 
and be walled by Mrs. Pierce with a broomstick. At the end of six months, you shall go to Buckingham Palace in a carriage, beautifully dressed. If the king finds out you're not a lady, you will be taken by the police to the Tower of London, where your head will be cut off as a warning to other presumptuous flower girls. I mean, it's terrible. And, and of course, Eliza doesn't have much of an option, so she agrees to allow herself to be stripped down, body and soul, by Higgins. He will be the Pygmalion, and she will be Galatea. And all of this will be expressed symbolically here in Act 2. The gramophone, her clothes, all of it representing a stripping down and rebuilding into Higgins' likeness. If he is successful, she will sound exactly like him. She will mirror him. When Eliza goes up with Mrs. Pierce to take her bath, we learn that she has never taken her clothes off before. She's never had a bath, and it scares her. Mrs. Pierce says to her, You know, you can't be a nice girl if you're a dirty slut inside. Eliza cries. She screams. She proclaims, Oh, if I'd have known what a dreadful thing it is to be clean, I'd never have come. The phrase Shaw uses to describe Eliza's experience with the scrubbing Mrs. Pierce gives her is a piteous spectacle of abject terror. The text reads that her screams are heart-ending. You know, from a uh, sociological perspective, um, I suspect this is something young Shaw absolutely saw on the streets in Dublin. And in the movie adaptation of Act Two, when Eliza looks at herself in a mirror in her apartment, she decides to go visit Higgins. And um, after she's clean, she doesn't recognize herself and she covers up in the mirror in the play. And Shaw's screenplay wants to reinforce even more than the stage performance, this idea of mirrors, of Pygmalion crafting another human being in his image. Yes, and ironically, as we see in Act 5, she will be unrecognizable even to herself when Higgins finishes, which is Mrs. Pierce's warning here in the beginning. The gramophone will always be there, as will the photographs, but her soul will grow, which is something to watch evolve over the course of the play. By the end of six months, Eliza can no longer recognize herself auditorily. She will be a child, and this is how Higgins describes it, who has lost her native tongue in the process of learning a new one. And as that transformation happens, she will become increasingly unfamiliar to herself, which is what will lead us to the anticlimactic ending that everyone gets so up in arms about at the end. And this is how Shaw's Pygmalion's myth diverges from the Greek myth. On the one hand, Higgins is successful. She mirrors him perfectly. He even admits that she has a better ear than he has, which is exactly why he congratulates himself when it's all over. He was successful. She is his phonetical mirror, his equal in that sense. But that's only one sense and an idea we want to have in our mind as we read Acts 4 and 5 and revisit again after we get to the end. There is another sense in which she absolutely outgrows him completely. And this is what enrages him in the end. Hmm, a little bit delicate, it sounds like. <laughs> it we, is. You know, Eliza isn't the only Doolittle in the play, and she's not the only Doolittle to have a social transformation. And one interesting parallel Shaw develops, and of course this is uh, even more interesting knowing Shaw was a devoted socialist, um, is the parallel between Doolittle and Higgins, and they are clearly foils to Eliza. You know, superficially very different, but absolutely identical in their treatment of Eliza. Alfred Doolittle, st uh, starting from his name, fulfills every stereotype that upper middle class people have of what he will call the undeserving poor. Alfred Doolittle is lazy, he's a drunk, a terrible father, and he's gone through at least six living girlfriends. By no measure of Victorian morality could he be considered a good no. person. But the most interesting aspect of his personality is that he has no shame in that. Uh, for all the shaming his culture does to people in, the, in his situation, what makes him unique is that he is really immune to it. And 
This is uh, one way he is absolutely the opposite of Higgins. He's quite aware of every one of his own shortcomings, and he's very self-aware. He knows he's allowed Eliza's uh, sixth stepmother to kick her out of the house, and he knows he's a filthy, unbathed dustman aiming for nothing in life except to get enough money um, out of everyone to spend another evening in the pub. And, you know, what may seem worst of all, but of course, uh, is this. He has no shame in this either. Here in Act 2, he's come to Higgins' home not to rescue his daughter from distress, but to see if he can get any money off the man he assumes is using his daughter as a prostitute. He wants to sell her, uh, and in this sense, as we line him up to Higgins for this financial transaction where, you know, Pickering asks Doolittle if he has any morals, and to which he responds, Can't afford them, Governor. Neither could you if you were as poor as me. Not that I mean any harm, you know, but if Eliza is going to have a bit out of this, why not me too? And, of course, if you were quick to catch it, you know, there we see it. Shaw is saying to his audience, that uh, all of us make moral compromises when we're living in survival mode. You know, so how can we judge those who really never get out of it? Well, I agree with that completely. And and I also agree that Higgins is completely unreflective. And in that sense, maybe Doolittle is better than him. But Doolittle, although admitting to be, you know, the undeserving poor, as he quoted, quotes it, I mean, he doesn't make us pity him. He's way too funny to be pitied. And I want to point out a social marker Shaw makes very distinct if you listen to how Doolittle talks, which we can't recreate this when we read their lines. No, we've already (laughs) failed it. We've tried French accents, Spanish accents, and we failed at this one. Alfred Doolittle has a shibboleth that reveals his class rank or lack thereof. He cannot pronounce his H's, and that is a sign of being a Cockney. He cannot say Henry Higgins. Instead, he says Henry Higgins. <laughs> but the sermon, the sermon Alfred Doolittle delivers here is so Chauvian. He's lecturing all of the middle or upper class patrons in any theater watching the production, condemning them of dehumanizing the poor by making an economic argument suggesting that morality is easy when you're comfortable. He's also pretty entertaining as he condemns men who mistreat their wives after marriage and women who encourage them uh, to stay drunk so that they'll just stay out of the way. Everything in some we hope is hyperbolic, but in some ways it isn't, and he makes us laugh. But here is Alfred Doolittle owning every vice he has so proudly. Don't say that, Governor. Don't look at it like that way. What am I, Governor? Both? I ask you, what am I? I'm one of the undeserving poor, that's what I am. Think of what that means to a man. It means that he's up again, middle class morality all the time. If there's anything going and I put in for a bit of it, I'm always the same story. You're undeserving, so you can't have it. But my needs is as great as the most deserving widows that ever got money out of six different charities in one week (laughs) for the death of the same husband. I don't need less than a deserving man. I need more. I don't eat less hearty than him, and I drink a lot more. (laughs) I mean, it's just funny. But with his exit, we leave Act 2 and we move to Act 3. Shaw carefully constructs this five-act play to leave little doubt as to the certainty of his anticlimactic ending, which I've referenced twice because everybody gets mad about it. But as is usual in any five-act play, uh, the climax occurs here in the third act and virtually resolves the dramatic question. As we have seen so far, the dramatic question that concerns Higgins is if Eliza will become a lady. And the action is carried out by Higgins. The receiver of this action is Eliza. She is acted upon. This, of course, is what Mrs. Higgins finds so appalling. And we watch the transition of Shaw sermonizing, leave the mouth of Alfred Doolittle and go into the mouth of Mrs. Higgins, Henry's mother. It's her at-home day, as she calls it, and we've learned when we studied Kate Chopin's The Awakening that that is a very important social responsibility for Victorian women. Mrs. Higgins has told Henry, because of that, to never visit her on that day at her at-home days because he irritates all of her female guests. 
But on this particular day, he's deliberately come because he has brought Eliza. He wants to pass her off in good society. So the scene unites all the characters from the opening scene. There's Henry Higgins, there's Colonel Pickering, there's Eliza, and then there's the Ainford Hills. We can remember that Freddie accidentally fell over and knocked over Eliza and all of her flowers in the first act. Clara recoiled in disgust, and she looked at Eliza as a nothing. All of the Ainsford Hills here will recognize her voice, sort of, but they don't remember from where. They don't know she's the flower girl. In this scene at Mrs. Higgins' house, the reaction of the Ainford Hills is so different because now they're interacting with a beautiful, well-spoken, well-dressed woman. And that's what's funny. Freddie, instead of falling over Eliza, falls in love with Eliza here in Act 3. Clara walks out, not in disgust of Eliza, but wanting to be Eliza. Eliza, of course, is the exact same person. She even talks about the most inappropriate things, except now they're pitched as the new small talk. And Clara leaves actually speaking in expletives, ironically, just like Eliza. The only two things that are different about Eliza is her pronunciation, her phonetics, obviously, and her dress. When Eliza enters the room, she produces, and I'm going to quote the the play, an impression of such remarkable distinction and beauty that they all rise quite fluttered. Quite fluttered. Well, (laughs) what is so funny about the whole scene uh, really is the dichotomy of what she says versus how she says it. And Eliza mirrors Higgins perfectly and her ear is perfect and her pronunciation is perfect and uh, except, uh, as we've already learned from Mrs. Pierce fussing at him, apparently Higgins cusses like a sailor and at home is a very uncouth person, even wiping his mouth on his shirt instead of a napkin. And he has no sense of what should or shouldn't be said, nor does he behave with grace. I mean, Eliza mirrors this too in some ways, but in other ways, her manners are ironically more refined than her makers. And Uh, She's been told to talk about nothing but the weather and everyone's health, and in a sense, that's exactly what she does. And She tells a story of an aunt who has claimed to have died from the flu, but Eliza thinks she was murdered. (laughs) What become of her new straw hat that should have come to me? Somebody pinched it, and what I say is, them that has pinched it, done her in. (laughs) It is such a funny scene. Later in Act 5, Eliza tells Pickering that it weren't for him, she'd have no idea how to behave at all because Higgins has no idea how poorly behaved he is, even though his mother tells him never to come around. Eliza explains that she learned social grace from Pickering, and we can understand her difficulty here. But it's also true that we will see she is building her own confidence in this scene. And in a sense, she developed her confidence from Pickering, too. Well, that's interesting. And I want to highlight a point uh, here real quick in that her father, Alfred Doolittle, is very reflective and very self-aware. And he is the exact contrast with (laughs) Higgins, who's very unself-aware and very unreflective. But anyway, uh, speaking of social graces, I want to talk about Eliza's use of profanity (laughs) here in Act 3. It is actually historically significant. You got to love it. Yeah. So at the end of the conversation between Eliza and the Ainsford Hills, Freddie is enthralled with Eliza. Ask her if she's going to walk across the park. Eliza responds with one of the most startling responses up to that point on the English stage. We're talking about millennia. Okay. She looks at him and adamantly proclaims, not bloody likely. You know, the word bloody, of course, was and is still uh, sort of an an expletive, and Eliza's use here is utterly and totally socially inappropriate for the London theater. You know, at the time uh, of the first performance in London, Lord Chamberlain's office was responsible for theater censorship. They controversially decided to allow her to say it because uh, they considered the incident funny and not obscene. And Shaw was in the audience that first night, And in a letter to his wife, he described what happened. When Not Bloody Likely came, the performance was nearly wrecked. They laughed themselves into such utter abandonment and disorder that it was really doubtful for some time whether they could recover themselves and let the play go on. (laughs) 
You know, besides uh, Shaw's experience, others have written about that evening. The stage manager on that same night timed the laughter, claiming that it lasted 76 seconds, making it possibly the longest laugh in English stage history. <laughs> I mean, it, it's really hard for us to imagine uh, as we're quite used to profanity on a regular basis now. The, you know, we don't feel the impact that this word had on those listeners and the prudes were aghast and complaints were made and the prime minister received an onslaught of outrage from the women's purity league and <laughs> it was such a big deal that Shaw worried it was overshadowing the entire play and in that same letter to charlotte he said this i have sent you dreary bundles of press clippings from which you will see that all the political and social questions have been swept from the public mind by eliza's expletive Triviality can go no further. You know, he wanted to make a statement, but he had no idea how much of a fuss one word was going to make. <laughs> by the end of that same spring, all over the country, the expression, not Pygmalion likely, became a popular thing to say. Uh, you know, no doubt there'd be memes all over social media. Oh, I'm media sure. We have to make one. Yes. Oh, yeah. We need to put one on a mug. <laughs> There you go. Uh, it's awesome. And in fact, that expression was used frequently all the way up until the 1970s. And in My Fair Lady, they tried to recreate the passion of the expletive by having Audrey Hepburn say, move your blooming arse. <laughs> but the moment was gone and the effect wasn't even close to the original. Well, that's a great story in and of itself. And, and I think we should definitely put it on a mug. I mean, Shaw apparently made his point too well about the power of language, maybe even the power of a single word in a single moment of time. That's kairos, the Greek term for that. What's even funnier, knowing how heavy hitting that word was during that time period, is that very that very next you know lines later, Clara ironically mimics Eliza, saying such bloody nonsense on her way out the door. Her mother saying she doesn't quite think she'll ever be able to use the word, which seems a point of distress. And Colonel Pickering reassures her. And let me quote Colonel Pickering. It's not compulsory, you know. <laughs> 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 of course it's not compulsory. Uh, it was made up. There was no such person saying that. But before we leave the conversation about the B word, when I first read this play in Act 2, we hear Mrs. Pierce scolding Higgins for using the B word too much. I didn't know he was talking about bloody. I thought he had another, she had another B word in mind. <laughs> there you go. Different time, different age. Uh, you know, I'm not sure I would have known what she was talking about either if I hadn't already known there was um, this social incident with the word bloody. <laughs> well, profanity aside, after the Ainsford Hills leave, Mrs. Higgins proceeds to scold both boys as if they were school children and not because Eliza used the B word. They asked her if she thought that Eliza would be presentable at the garden party, and this is what she said. You silly boy, of course she's not presentable. She's a triumph to your art and her dressmakers. But if you suppose for a moment that she doesn't give herself away in every sentence she utters, you must be perfectly cracked about her. Pickering responds, But don't you think something might be done? I mean, something to eliminate the sanguinary elements from her conversation? And Miss Higgins responds, not as long as she's in Henry's hands. <laughs> she uh, certainly knows her son. And, um, you know, with all of his privileged upbringing and formal education, he is no more a gentleman than Alfred Doolittle. And I love how Mrs. Higgins expresses this. Uh, she absolutely sees it. And she knows better than anyone that he is incorrigible. Higgins is a character who cannot change. You certainly are a pretty pair of babies playing with your live doll. That's what she says. Gary, read uh, Higgins' response. Playing the hardest job I ever tackled. Make no mistake about that, mother. But you have no idea how frightfully interesting it is to take a human being and change her into a quite different human being by creating a new speech for her. It's filling up the deepest gulf that separates class from class and soul from soul. So, Kirsty, why is this the climax of the story and not the scene at the garden party? Well, for one thing, uh, the scene is not guaranteed. It's not in all the versions of the play. Of course, again, there is a version where we do get to see what happens at that party, and, and the movie version definitely shows it, but it's not essential. In the version that shows the party, Eliza attracts the interest of an old 
student of Higgins, and he spreads the story that Eliza is a poser, that she really is a Hungarian princess incognito. In this extended version of Act 3, Eliza's last lines to Higgins, and she doesn't even know how jubilant he is when she says this, she says this, I don't think I can bear much more. The people all stare so at me. An old lady has just told me that I speak exactly like Queen Victoria. I am sorry if I have lost your bet. I've done my best, but nothing can make me the same as these people. And then Pickering responds to her, You have not lost it, my dear. You have won it ten times over. Pickering again ends with a word of kindness, and which we see in Act 4 is something Higgins absolutely will not extend to Eliza. Higgins, although an agent of change, in no way evolves in the play. And that, of course, is the most ironic point of all in a morality lesson for those of us who are too proud and therefore incorrigible. Eliza transforms from a flower girl to a duchess. But in another sense, she evolves from a mere gramophone to a genuine lady. Higgins tears her down while Pickering builds her up. And at some point, she clearly understands that she does. She does have feelings. And not just that. She's capable of great dignity. She learns that she has agency. And she always has, like every other living, breathing person in this world, the agency to make choices, to take risks, and to cut toxic people from your life. (laughs) I guess that would be... Mr. Higgins. Yes. Well, that is a lesson that most of us cannot learn early enough in life. You know, uh, one other thing, we cannot leave our discussion of Higgins as a professor without talking about psychologist and professor Robert Rosenthal. Um, In the mid-1950s, he was finishing up his doctoral dissertation and accidentally stumbled on an educational theory that would be duplicated over 500 times in the years after. And in fact, it's still to be duplicated. And it it totally upended our understanding of educational theory. And he would call his findings the Pygmalion effect. Oh, yes. I I think the Pygmalion effect is a, a good note to end on. Tell us what it is. Well, Dr. Rosenthal led an experiment where his students were to conduct uh, experiments on two sets of rats. Without the knowledge of his students, he labeled one set of rats uh, the maize bright rats, and he labeled the other set of rats the maize dull rats. Uh, uh, There was absolutely no difference in the rats. They were exactly the same and randomly assigned, and the only difference was in the label. The students were told to teach the different rats uh, a certain series of tasks, and What he uncovered really made no sense, especially when you realize he was dealing with rats. At the end of the experiment, the rats who were labeled as gifted rats outperformed those who were labeled as the dull rats. Now, rats can't read. Uh, They do not know about labels. The only factor differentiating the two sets of rats was the knowledge of those who were conducting the experiment. Somehow, they were unconsciously um, influencing the performance of the rats to such a degree that it was noticeable. It was measurable, measurably noticeable uh, that the so-called bright rats were doing things the dull rats could never do. And the conclusion was called the Pygmalion effect, and it's the idea that we uh, get better performance by people when greater expectations are put on them. And this is without the knowledge of students. And since the rat study, um, obviously this study was replicated in classrooms and other places all over the world. You know, uh, they were wondering if this is actually true. It's been tried over decades under varying circumstances. And every circumstance, regardless of the changes, students of any kind, of any age, who were taught by people who thought they were high achievers, always outperform those in the control group, even though every other factor is controlled you know, really including uh, any awareness of people's expectations on the part of the students. And the magnitude of the results are consistent. There is a self-fulfilling nature of interpersonal expectations. So just as at this party, they expected a Hungarian princess. When we expect a princess, that's what we get. Exactly. I have every certainty Shaw would be so proud to have this significant study named after his play. It's 
very uh, it's a very Fabian conclusion. <laughs> uh, oh yes, it is. And, and Higgins is right when he states in Act One: not only can our class markers reveal our past history and our present condition, but they absolutely determine our future. And that, in large part, has nothing to do with how we behave or feel about ourselves, but how we are seen and thus treated by others. Eliza's lines in Act Five on this topic are some of the most memorable in the whole play. The difference between a lady and a flower girl is not how she behaves, but how she is treated. Her transformation from flower girl to duchess happens. That's what happens in Act 3. If you remember from our earlier podcasts and other series about the Freytag plot triangle, you may remember that in drama, the moment of climax in any piece of literature is when the protagonist confronts the conflict. He makes a decision from which there can be no return. And it's downhill from that point on, and it's just a working out of the results after that encounter, that decision, that confrontation. In this case, it is in Act 3, when Eliza succeeds in fooling all of English society that she is a duchess. It is at this point she passes the point of no return. She will never or can never be a flower girl again, not even if she wants to be. The question of the rest of the play is the question raised by Mrs. Pierce in Act 2 and Mrs. Higgins, but it's utterly ignored by Higgins. What will become of Eliza? And no matter what Higgins' feelings are on the matter, it is something Shaw claims cannot be bloody ignored. Oh, my. <laughs> It's not Pygmalion likely that we will be ignoring it. Um, It will be our uh, discussion next episode. Uh, So thanks for listening today as we continued our discussion through Acts 2 and 3 of Pygmalion. Next week we will finish our discussion of what appears to be a delightful comedy, which it is, but mostly a scathing criticism on uh, man's passive aggressive inhumanity to man. We hope you've enjoyed this play as much as we have. Don't forget to check out the website, howtolovelitpodcast.com. You'll find listening guides for all past episodes if you're an English teacher. You can also support us through our donation page. Perhaps, most importantly, you can get a mug, (laughs) t-shirt, or sticker with our logo or some other favorite quotes. And tell your friends all about us. Thanks. Peace out. Peace out.